Good morning. Today's the day I start my apple breeding video series. Yay! I'm excited. This is a subject I'm excited about in general. For the last four years I've been breeding apples, uh, making intentional crosses between two different apples, saving the seeds, growing them out to uh, create new varieties of fruit. So in this video we're going to talk about why I'm doing that and why I think more people should do it. And then in the coming series you'll be able to follow my progress from pollinating blossoms this spring hopefully for years to come all the way through fruiting which could take um, quite a while. Not only will we follow the um, progress of my overall project but we're actually going to follow specific crosses that I make and I've already shot that footage for this spring. So this is a long-term project. I'm looking at, um, you know, probably four to six years till I get any fruit from my first efforts. I've been at it for, I think, about four years now. And a lot of people also have heard that it takes, you know, literally thousands of seedlings, like you have to grow thousands of seedlings to get one good apple. And that almost for sure, if you just plant an apple seed, you're just gonna get some sour green thing that's no good to eat. Okay, that is not true, period, not true, okay? Uh, let's start with that. So that idea is popularized by a lot of authors, uh, research type authors, you know, that go and they do a bunch of research and then, you know, write a book. And who they're interviewing is they're interviewing apple breeders. Who else would you interview about apple growing and breeding, right? So there's a problem. Up until about the very late 1800s, pretty much all apples to speak of were selections. That means that they were just picked out of um, hedgerows and stuff where a seedling, you know, a bird dropped a seed and it sprouted up. Or at the best, they were grown from a seed of an apple that someone liked. So let's say you're eating, you know, Cox's Orange Pippin and you're like, damn, this is a good apple. It's the best apple I ever had. So you'd save the seeds, you plant them and you're thinking, well, you know, um, Hopefully the uh, offspring won't fall too far from the tree, as they say, and you'll get something similar to Cox Orange Pippin or hopefully an improvement. Then around 18, late 1800s, um, a group at the Geneva Breeding Agricultural Station started a breeding program, like an actual kind of scientific study of what the possibilities were for actually intentionally crossbreeding apples. So they made a bunch of crosses and they grew out 106 seedlings. Out of those 106 seedlings, they actually named 13 varieties. Okay, so that's over 10% um, apples that they actually thought were worth naming. And then there were another, I think, 14 that they thought were worthy of further observation. Around the same time, Albert Etter, uh, one of my plant breeding heroes and just heroes in general was starting to work with apples up in Northern California at Ettersburg in Humboldt County not too far from here and he had the same idea he uh, asked one of his mentors some old probably gray bearded man and uh, the guy was like, don't bother, you know, if apples could have been improved then people would already have done it so he was like, well, I don't know about that. And he kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And finally, <clears throat> he started a very large scale for then apple breeding project on his land in Humboldt County, out of which came a bunch of good apples. He, he saw improvements and good apples and good averages coming out of his very first efforts at breeding. And his take on it was kind of like, well, if you just get a whole bunch of really good apples, um, that's most of the battle right there. Um, he trialed 500 different varieties of apples that which he collected. So this was, you know, him preparing for years just to, to start this project. And his conclusion, which is similar to my conclusion after collecting a couple hundred of even carefully researched varieties, most of them anyway, is that most of those apples are not very good. You know, most of the apples that exist, he said, are just not that good and they definitely need improving. And again, he saw improvements right away and he bred some amazing apples. Uh, Catherine's one of my favorites. 
um, some of the red fleshed apples. He, he bred pink pearl, um, crimson gold, and probably his crowning achievement is Wixen, a very small high sugar apple that often becomes people's favorite apple when they taste it. Okay, so there you go. Yes, he grew thousands of seedlings. Yes, it took him thousands of seedlings to get, you know, one Wixen and a handful of other amazing apples. But his general results were pretty good. And he saw improvements right away. Okay, third example, my friend Freddie Benj, who's um, a veteran fruit explorer and all around great guy. He's been growing apples from seeds for quite a while and he's not, um, I think recently he's been cross-pollinating, but before that I think he was just taking seeds from apples that he liked. And of those, I just spoke to him recently just in a private conversation, and he said that he's getting more apples worth eating out of his seedling trials than aren't worth eating. Okay, so that tells you a lot right there, and I think we can completely dispel and give up the myth that we need thousands of seedlings. Sometimes I'll say, you know, six to 10,000 seedlings to get one good variety. Not true. What they actually mean, what those breeders are talking about, is that by the stringent criteria of modern breeders, that's how, what it takes to get a, a successful, or at least a commercial variety, a variety that they think is worthy of releasing as a commercial variety, hoping that it will be successful. If you take all the criteria you need for a modern apple, usually the first one is looks, texture, disease resistance, and when I say disease resistance, I mean disease resistance, you know, multiple diseases. Um, they're not able to breed all the all the resistances into one apple, but it's it's a major goal, and it takes a lot of effort to, and time to try to breed those traits in. Then um, uh, oh, I know, I remember keeping keeping quality, and finally flavor. Okay, notice I put flavor last. That's because flavor is usually last, unfortunately. The goals of commercial breeders are driven by the money that funds their research. Their, their, it's the pay, pay the bills, basically. And that is commercial growing interests. Since the turn of the century, the, since the early 18, late 1800s, we've seen a steady progression that's just gotten more and more entrenched of a global, this global grocery store based food economy where production is centralized and even varieties of fruit and vegetables are basically brands now. So that has some, that's some good and some bad to that. It means that we can get uh, fresh fruit all year. It means that we sometimes will have consistently, consistency, uh, even if it's consistently bad which it often is. And, you know, some of that stuff is good, okay? But there's, we lose a lot too in that system, having that system. And one thing we lose is diversity. And we also end up getting what the market dictates or what, often it just, we get what the, the marketers and the growers, because this marketing now goes all the way back to the to the breeding projects, think that we want, okay? And before that, the market has tried to train us to want certain things. So they train, tried to train us to want these big, shiny, red, conical, perfect looking apples that were shiny and beautiful, but just mushy and terrible when you bit into them. And they sold us those things by the billions of pounds for years and years and years, and we bought them, and they were no good. They were never any good. You know, if you got one right off the tree, maybe, but even the quality of the cultivars, the Red Delicious, declined as they selected more and more red and more and more perfect looking apples. Those apples didn't happen to be 
the mutations and cultivars that tasted the best. They were just the ones that looked the best. So looks is pri that's a high priority for those guys and they have this whole marketing thing where they think they know what we want as consumers. And I don't, I don't think that's always true and I also think that the market can be retrained for instance to like very small, very tasty high sugar apples for instance. So again, without going into any more exhaustive detail, the, the goals of breeders and large scale growers and the marketers and the grocery stores, all of which are now the same line of thinking, um, are not the same as our goals. What do we want? We want flavor is probably going to be the top and texture. Um, after that, we're thinking, you know, season, keeping quality. I mean, looks, once anyone's bitten into an apple that is just totally amazing, is not going to care what that apple looks like that much anymore. There's a whole class of apples called russets, and they are covered, you know what a russet potato is, so it has this kind of like rough covering to it. So the apples will be more or less covered, sometimes completely, sometimes just partially, with a kind of a rough uh, surface, a brown surface. And that surface may contribute to their unique flavor because russets as are kind of a class of apples that are known for having very good, unique flavor. or It's like a class of, of flavors. And that may have something to do with that russet coating. Now, a plant breeder isn't going to touch that apple with a 10-foot pole because of the way it looks. If you look at old oil paintings, you'll see russets because they're beautiful, okay? But they're not this like shiny new car on the lot look. They're more kind of a, a classical beautiful with multiple hues and textures and depth and they make great subjects for painting. But breeders aren't going to touch those. So, again, different goals. Okay, 